So this evening, um, Matthew O'Keefe, who is the Benedictus music tutor, um, we're delighted that he's able to be here. And what's more, he's brought some of the singers from the Scherzo Ensemble, who have worked with us before on uh, summer school activities that we do um, related to music. And Matthew is going to um, give us an introduction, and I won't go into the details of what he's doing. He will introduce the singers, and it just remains to me to welcome him. Thank you for coming, and look forward to the evening. Hello everyone, thanks for coming. Um, as Claire said, I'm going to speak about music in the Mass, specifically settings of the ordinary, um, and specifically cyclic settings of the ordinary. When we say um, the Mass, musically speaking, what are we talking about? Well, we could be talking about any number of things. Um, we happen to be talking about five musical movements or prayers in the Mass, um, which are now said by the people, um, but used to be said by all sorts of different people. Um, the Kyrie, Gloria, the Credo, the Sanctus, Pale of Benedictus, and the Agnus Dei. Um, and it's no accident that that became the Mass cycle, and the settings of the Mass uh, were musical compositions of those texts. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take you through uh, those individual parts of the Mass, where they come from, uh, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the history of setting them as a cycle, as a work, um, and then try and draw some sort of idea about why this, it's set as a, a unified cyclical uh, piece. Um, I want to start with a very lovely quote by a man called uh, Peter Wagner, who um, wrote the first big history of the music of the Mass um, in about 1955, I think it came out, um, and in 1955. And uh, he says, the musical form of the Mass is the noblest fruit of the bond rich with blessing that for nigh on 2,000 years has bound together liturgy and art. Musical interests and strivings alone could never have brought this about. Outside of the, liturgical, lit uh, outside of the frame of liturgy, it would have occurred to no artist to link together these texts like those of the Mass. The liturgy created this artistic build from loosely just juxtaposed pieces an inwardly linked cyclic form, the vessel for their most brilliant inspirations. So that would, would have been a nice quote if I'd have read it well. So, I'm, um, <laughs> so look that up and read it well to yourself. So we'll start talking a bit about the parts of the ordinary. Um, we've got three main sources, so you've probably heard all about this in your history of construction of the Mass Talks, but just to quickly recap, we have the apostolic tradition, which is um, uh, by Hippolytus in around 215 in Rome, um, and we have it from sources from Egypt, but it's a Roman text. And then there's the Apostolic Institutions, which are Eastern, um, and then we have the Order Romanus, which is from the reign of Gregory I, Pope Gregory I in the 6th century. So there are three main sources for how the Mass came together, um, and some of our movements are there, and some of them aren't. So we have the Kyrie first, the exact wording is found in scripture quite often, in the Psalms and in the Gospels, when Bartimaeus says, when the blind beggar, oh, have mercy on me, Lord, it's exactly the same text, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison. And its preservation in Greek is a sign of its, of its antiquity. Um, it's from Eastern litanies, which are um, some chants with extended repetitions. Um, so the Kyrie eleison, was put in between prayers and, and chants and exclamations, and it went on for as long as you wanted it to. It wasn't a strict um, uh, length of prayer um, at its conception. Uh, they made their way to Rome uh, after the persecution stopped. Um, the Christian communities used to gather at one church, process all together to a different church to have a liturgy as a sort of witness of faith. And um, one of the things they would do on this walk is sing Kyrie litanies. And this is where it comes from. When they stopped doing these processions, the Kyrie made its way into the Mass and into the church, and it becomes situated where it is now. But beforehand, it was a free form. You can say it as many times as you like, and you interpose prayers with the Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. So, um, uh, the ninefold structure, the rigid structure, is, isn't set until the 6th century in the Order of Romans. Um, and it's, it's actually originally ninefold, so you have three Kyrie's, three Christes, three Kyrie's. So there's all these uh, lots of 
uh, cycles of um, Trinitarian references there. Um, in the Middle Ages, very popular was the practice of troping Kyrie, which is where you take a long chant, and um, in the melismatic phrases, which are the bits which just have one vowel, like Kyrie, it goes on and on. Um, what they started doing, particularly in England and Italy, was writing rhymed poetry to be sung to the word extra notes. So you sing Kyrie, and then you'd sing your poem that people would write in monasteries and the convents. Um, and that was very popular. So you had the holy part, the ancient part of the text, Kyrie at the beginning and a lace at the end. And in the middle, you were free to um, express personal devotion and personal <coughs> piety. Not that personal, because someone else wrote it for you, but quite personal. Personal to your, um, so your local uh, church or local community. Um, uh, this is an example of how mass music is very innovative in what it can do to other genres and for other genres. So here we have um, whole um, genres like Conductus, which is a French 12th and 13th century genre of rhymed metrical poetry sung in um, stanza form. This comes from troping curious. Tracts, you know what a tract is? Is that thing on the, uh, is that the replaces the Alleluia? And sequences which come on feast days after the Alleluia. The development of the sequence as a poetic form comes from out of doing the same thing, prosulating, they call it, putting words to the end of an Alleluia chant. So we have examples all over the shop, even very early, we're talking sort of 8th and 9th centuries here, of singing in mass having extraordinary um, uh, benefits on to developing new genres um, of secular and secular music. Um, the Kyrie is the awakening of our hunger and desire for the sacrament. When we are at Mass, the Kyrie is like the advent of what we're about to experience. Um, it's also the song of the church in exile. It's uh, the, the Hebrew, is, you know, it's from, from in the Bible, that, that's what it's for. It's the song of the church in exile. It's for us to prepare ourselves for the sacrament. Kyrie eleison. I'm going to sing you a little example now, so I'm going to bring the singers up. We want to just sing you a quick example of this um, trope to kill you. So here's the Kyrie in its original form from uh, Kyriale in the 13th century. Kyrie. Interpolated, troped, Kyrie. Um, this is a memorial of ancient chants by uh, prophets in moments of inspiration. It's much like a canticle, like a Magnificat or Bene Benedictus. Um, the Gloria was originally a morning hymn, not O-U, O-R, a morning hymn uh, sung at hours by, in the Eastern Church. Um, and it was recommended, our first instance of hearing about it, is it, it's recommended by St. Athanasius as a good prayer to sing in the morning. Uh, from a work he wrote in the 4th century to a, a convent. Sing the glory in the morning, it will be good for you, is, is, is what he's really recommended. Um, it's uh, found in the Apostolic Institutions, and its oldest Latin text is in the Antiphonary of Bangor. So the oldest text we have the glory in Bangor in the 7th century. It was added to Mass in the 6th, though, we think, from this Athanasius' suggestions and, and other, other reasons. Um, Originally, it was only put at Christmas, because
because obviously if we remember that the beginning of Gloria is the text that the shepherds say, glory to God, glory to God. That's our reference for the beginning of Gloria is the Christmas hymn. And only a bishop was allowed to say it because only a bishop was allowed to intone it at Mass. Um, but by the 12th century, Gloria was pretty standard in all Masses of joy. Um, so that's come in after the Kyrie. Uh, the Kyrie and the Gloria have, um, they're sort of paired, so we have the Advent in Mass and Christmas in Mass straight away afterwards. We've got this um, paralleling in prayer in every Mass of the liturgical year. Um, the structure of the Gloria is, as we say, it's a Christmas hymn at the beginning, then there's, um, then, uh, you're asking for peace from the Son, and it's a prayer for salvation, and then you invoke the Spirit, and it's a joyful prayer for the Trinity, and that's how it rounds off. And this structure, um, three-part structure, is, is exploited by composers. You can already see how you might start to split up these prayers, how you how might feed into how you um, compose them. Quick word on the credo, obviously you know where it comes from in Council Nicaea, but um, it was only slowly adopted into the liturgy in various places at different times, wherever they had a problem with what people believed. So if people start believing the wrong thing, the bishop would ask the Pope if they could say the creed in their mass just to remind people what the Orthodox belief was. And that became pretty standard in all the Roman liturgy in 1014, at the request of Henry II, who had a bit of a problem with all of his subjects. And so he said, no, we're going to have to say the creed in every mass because um, people are forgetting what to believe. Um, it has uh, a narrative and dramatic uh, function as well. When you, if you read the creed, um, it brings you through time, and it has, it, um, for the people who understand uh, it in its uh, Greek form, which I don't really, but someone told me, that it has um, an incredibly um, delicate sort of a, a skip to it as well. So it clearly, it's, meant, it's written in a way so as to not just tell you what the belief is, but actually tell you in a memorable form in its original uh, form, you're, you're meant to be able to memorise the creed very easily. Um, it acts as a transition between the Mass of the Catechumens, which is everything up until the creed, and the Mass of the Faithful, which is the Eucharist and everything, everything after it. So it has a very important stamp as a point in the middle of our Mass as well. Um, and so if you think about how composers might set the creed, obviously there's a lot of drama there. Um, he was crucified in one sentence and died the next sentence, and the next sentence he's risen again, and if that's not just about the uh, most amazing musical transition in a bar, I don't know what, what would be. So, um, yeah, composers had a lot of fun with that. Now, Sanctus, um, it's from Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 3, it's his vision of heaven, um, uh, and lot, uh, I think the leading theory on its honor origin is actually from the synagogue, that it, it was a, a prayer in the synagogue before, in, in the temple, before it made its way into our man's literature. And it's not found in the canon of Hippolytus, which is um, odd, but it's found everywhere else, both pre- and post-dating that. Um, it sort of interrupts, some semantic just interrupts the preface, it comes to the end, and it, it interrupts um, with, with often a very long piece of music, um, the prayers going on at the altar. Um, it's, the, as I say, it's the end of the preface, and in it we associate ourselves with the praises of the celestial choirs. So we are associated, we're trying to join in with the angelic, cho angelic chorus. Um, and as I say, it sort of interrupts the Eucharistic prayer. And because of this, um, the rest of the canon, after its <coughs> inclusion musically, started to be recited silently. Because we had these long chants, so in, in order to try and cut down on the time of the Mass, they um, had the rest of the um, canon recited silently by the presiding. Um, Benedictus, obviously the words of the crowd during Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Interestingly, the words Hosanna and Sabaoth, or the Sabbath, uh, are from the Church of Palestine and have never really been translated in, 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 the, in the Roman liturgy. Um, some of them think they're just too difficult to translate, others quite like the sound of them, and, and I can see why composers certainly did, because it's a lovely word to set, Hosanna. And, um, Lots and lots of settings change time signature or mensuration pattern um, for the Hosanna because if you have plenty sunt celli and terra, it's a nice three, but sanctus, 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 dominus, deus is in two. Like, and, and almost all composers sort of pick up on these natural speech rhythms and use them to inform their composition. <coughs> and finally, the other day is of Syrian origin and um, in the Church of Syria, they had a very specific kind of bread, um, as 
not that specific, but it was quite different to our uh, what, what we were using in our Western church at the same time in the 8th century. Breaking the bread in the Eastern Orthodox um, liturgy has always been much more of an intrinsic part of the service. The physical breaking up of the loaf into smaller fragments in order to distribute is a practical, ceremonial, um, symbolic, um, and incredibly necessary um, job in, uh, in, the, in the Mass. So the chanting of the Anus Day, much like the Kyrie, where it was treated as a litany, you could do it as many times as you wanted to cover the amount of time it took people to break up this the flat bread of the body of Christ and distribute it to the people. Um, we did, we, um, the Western Church started using individual like sort of wafers and smaller, um, smaller uh, hosts in a lot earlier. In, but the Eastern Church doesn't do it still, but we were already trying to come up with ideas as to how we could streamline the Eucharistic process. And the Eastern ones, so they had this on this day, which they would recite for 20 minutes whilst everything was being prepared to, for distribution. And it was brought in when we had Syrian Pope, Pope Sergius in uh, sort of 700, and uh, yes, as I say, it was a litany. And it was only repeated to three times, much like the Kyrie was repeated, uh, limited to, to nine, in the 12th century, um, so a lot later on, when fraction and mingling and all these things were very much simplified. Um, it's essentially a prayer for peace. And the fact that it has these three sections, and the third section is different, um, it has a sort of ascending uh, tricolor about it. It uh, takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Who takes away the sins of the world, and then you're at your arrival point, the grant us peace. It has a natural crescendo, again, which is uh, <coughs> um, going to be, as we will see, uh, exploited by the composers who turn their pen to it. So they're the parts of the mass. They've all come in at different times. They all have incredibly different <coughs> Functions as well. The Sanctus has a character, you, you know, your you're, you're angelic choruses, the, the Gloria, you're, you're a shepherd on a hill, the Agnus Dei, you're, you're, being, you're, you're doing a litany, Kyrie is a litany, the Credo is a, a very firm stamp of your faith. So, why on earth are these all grouped together? Um, well, the background to this is um, that the first wave of codifying chance of the Mass and putting them into groups happened in the 10th century under the Carolingians and trying to uh, establish the Holy Roman Empire, trying to establish the church, the Catholic church as, as, as their church and as an excuse really to um, uh, spread their authority over every, everyone's lives. And um, the second wave, which was a lot more positive, was the friars in the 13th century. The Kyriale of the Franciscan Gradual in 1251 is the first work to group these five parts and call them something. So we have typically there's 18 masses, then six credos afterwards. They're not put in, but we have the Kyrie, Gloria, uh, Sanctus, Sanctus Day, and then six credos at the end. And then you have a lot of different things, different bits. So there's a Kyrie fragments if you don't like any of the ones that they put in the masses. And that's when they first gave them names as well. So Orbis Factor, De Angelis, all these things we know, they come from Franciscan Kyriali when, when they started being grouped together. Um, however, composed parts of the Mass were still um, listed separately in indexes in, in manuscripts. So, composed parts are still separate, but the chants are forming these blocks of what will soon become a sort of uh, masses. At the same time, the role of the people was becoming much more restricted. Um, from the 12th century, choirs became more important, and the chants got harder and longer, and you had to be much more professional to sing it. And also, newly Christianized nations were no longer familiar with Latin. So, you, you not only had to be a good singer, but also you had to know the Latin, which was a lot easier if you were Roman or from Roman provinces, but um, not so easy if you're a newly Christianized nation. Um, the 13th century, as well as having this uh, gradual, um, gradual, gradual collection, um, also saw the crystallization of two very important doctrines. One of purgatory and one of transubstantiation. And this sharpened focus on the redemptive power of the Eucharist through a fear of purgatory where the roots for the artistic creation of the cyclic mass uh, in the 15th century lie. So remember these two things. There's purgatory, is a lot more on people's minds, and the idea that you can save yourself from it with the redemptive power of the Eucharist. Earliest examples now of composed masses. But there's a Tournai mass, which is a collection of the ordinary and also the Nita Misaest 
the dismissal, that, that found its way in ordinary connection, collections up until the 14th century. Um, but the easy thing to see is that that's a collection by lots of different composers, and that's just a, a, comp a compilation of people writing different things, and then someone's grouped them together and called it a mass. But that's not what we think of as a mass yet. Then we have the first thing we would think of, which is the Messe de Notre Dame by Macho. I just sense a little movement because I know we're going to sing some of this. Um, this was written about 1360, um, and it's the first solo composed, titled, attributed, ordinary setting. But I wouldn't call it a cyclic mass setting yet because all those movement movements sound incredibly different. There's no unifying theme, it doesn't sound like the same work. It's just one man has written a different piece for each of the bits of the ordinary. Um, he was in Bremen Cathedral and had access to marvellous singers, um, as you can tell, because it's incredibly difficult. Um, and then there's Dufay's Mass in 1420, the, um, the St. James Mass, and that's a very large scale work. So, so there's three examples before the mid 15th century, and they're all slightly odd, and they don't quite fit in what we identify as Mass. Now we're going to sing you just a little bit of the Masho Mass now. <coughs> um, I want to first show you a bit of the Einus Day, which has this sort of, um, melismatic uh, phrases, little hockets, which are interesting rhythmic playing, playing around figures. Um, this is the Einus yeah, Day, and then we're going to hear the Gloria, which as you'll hear is completely different. It's, uh, syllabic, it's all about trying to spit out the words, and it uses much more um, interesting harmony.
not really trying to set the words necessarily and, and trying to capture the individual character of lines, but it's trying to give an overall difference between movements. And note how it set the Jesu Christi, even at this time, from very early on, there's a double, there's actually a different kind of, kind of line before and after the name Jesu Christi. And you heard it slowed down, it had extra interesting and nice chords. So Jesu Christi is starting to be very important in setting, in setting the mass. <coughs> so 15th century developments now. We're starting to get to what we think of as a mass cycle. The label of Missa is a, um, as a collection of settings of the ordinary by a single composer of services around here it starts to become uh, accepted here in the mid 15th century. The development of uh, the setting goes hand in hand with the development of widespread personal piety. So an understanding of one's personal <coughs> responsibility for salvation is becoming much more important. Obit services and endowments for sung requiem masses every year, um, often set up with a particular setting in mind, drove the market for these compositions. And so people are realizing that they themselves have to do something about their own salvation, they, they're going to have an endowment, they're going to pay for a mass to be said every year, and they're going to ask for a specific setting of that mass to be sung every year. Um, Tintoris, at this point, music theorist, says that the mass is the cantus magnus, it's um, the most important genre that a composer could write at this point. And I think there's, a, there's quite a lot of symmetry between um, the mass of the 15th and 16th centuries and the symphony of the 18th and 19th. So you have a large scale form, different movements, you're pulling ideas across all movements, you're trying to say something more than usually you can just say musically. Um, it's also the home of stylistic innovation um, at, in these centuries as well, but at all times, uh, uh, in my opinion, the um, innovation is determined by the meaning and shape of the ritual which it adorned, it's not just doing its own thing. Um, extolling the power of the real presence is always the aim of a cyclical mass. And I'll come on to how it does that a bit later. Um, a quick potted history now of where the places to be at for mass composition are. Um, and we'll hear little examples of each one. So 1445 to 1416, it's all about the English. And um, uh, they're really saying masses quite well. You've got Dunstable and Lionel Power. Um, they had a huge influence over the developing Burgundy and Flemish, Franco-Flemish school in the Low Countries. Um, and they developed the Cantus Firmus technique, which is where you take some plain chant and you set it in long notes, and you have other um, parts moving around it. But that, so the old plain chant is the, the rock-solid foundation of your, of your piece. So we're going to hear a Sanctus by Dunstable now. Um, and it uses uh, Mr. DeAngelis as its uh, as its transformer. So have a listen out for Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. That's what we're as far as we're going to get, but because it's long. But um, um, listen out for that and hear what he does and how he uses those notes to compose a piece with. <coughs>
is Cantus Firmus technique from the middle of the 15th century. <coughs> Um, the focus now moves to this Franco-Flemish school of composers, and uh, hopefully you've heard of, heard of some of these. Ockeghem, Josquin, Obrecht, Brumel, they all wrote in um, quite an earthy, um, <coughs> quite thick textured way, and also they are starting to be influenced by humanism now. They're starting to think about what the music means, uh, does it engage the intellect of people here, it's not just the senses. So that music is, uh, it's a wash, isn't it? It's a glorious wash of noise, and it's putting you in a sacramental mood. And as Son Augustine talks about a lot, it's meant to put you into a state in which you can experience something transcendental. You're not trying to meditate on what the word sanctus means, you're trying to allow something spiritual to tell you what Sanctus means. However, these composers are sort of changing some of that, and Josquin is the most important person at this point. He wrote lots of different um, masses uh, and used a technique called paraphrasing. So we've heard Cantus Firmus, which is where you use the exact notes of a chant. Paraphrasing is where you use the melody of a chant, but you use it in a very much more interesting way, and you don't use it all, you use little bits of it. And, um, you might use it at the beginning of the movement and then stop. Or you might bring it back in halfway through in the second part of it. Basically, it's being a lot more inventive. And Josquin wrote an excellent mass setting called a, a Missa Pangalingua, and he uses the opening Pangalingua chant. I chose this one because I think you probably all know the Pangalingua chant, so you can listen out for whenever it turns up. So we're going to sing for you now um, Missa Pangalingua, just the first section of the Kyrie, where Josquin uses... Um, the plain chant motif, and he does interesting things with it. You're actually getting, you're actually able to hear the um, words much more specifically. There's fewer parts, they're achieving textures with fewer forces. You're trying, it's trying to make you um, emphasize with this, um, not emphasize, um, empathize with the singers more. You're, you're allowing them to put their personal um, feelings of devotion and, and, and piety in, into the music. And the way that they're um, imitating each other shows that it's a, a much more uniform output, it's, it's a complete composition. If you heard the stuff going on in England at the time, after Dunstable and Lionel Power died, it's um, music uh, written for sort of 20 parts, and it's enormous in its sound. The Eaton, Eaton Choir book, has anyone heard of the Eaton Choir book? It's all these enormous pieces lasting 15 minutes and they're impenetrable. And here on the continent, 
there's this incredibly um, to the point. Uh, it's very, very. Um, it has clarity. It has music with clarity of word and melody. So that's what's going on with Joscan and other people who are from uh, from Franco Flemish school, and a lot of them working in Rome as well. They're working in Rome. Um, at this time, there starts to be a big tradition in setting the mass of the Loma Arme Mass. <coughs> Loma Arme was a song um, that people sang going, <coughs> Lome, Lome, Loma Arme, something like that. And uh, it's, uh, it's a war song that the army sang. And every major composer from this period uses it as a cantus firmus, or as a paraphrase, and sets it in the mass. And there's about 50 Loma Arme Masses. And no one's quite sure why, but some, some, some of the big ideas are, um, it reflected a sort of martial allegory, which um, draw, was drawn from medieval mass commentary, that the mass is, is our weapon in the fight. Um, and again, with much more understanding of like salvation as a fight um, against the devil, not against non-Christians, but actually a, a fight in our everyday life against evil forces, um, Loma may seem like an appropriate uh, thing to include. They're trying to draw on images of Christ as the, as the warrior. Now, back to England. In the 1510s and 20s, Fairfax and Ludford are two composers writing lots of masses, this time lady masses, writing lady masses. And lady masses are for weekdays. They're, they're not specifically for big feasts, like most masses are. Um, they're, 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 sh they're not too short, they're quite long. But they're quite simple, um, uh, using some ideas of concentric practice. Um, but still, they're very archaic. Still archaic um, in the way they're setting the mass. Then Taverner and Shepherd and Ty are three next-generation English composers, starting in the 20s to the 40s, and they use the Cantus Firmus techniques. Um, but instead of, um, as we've heard, employing them freely like Joscan's doing, they go back to this very turgid way of using them. Um, whole bars, long notes, breeze on each note of the chant. The movements last 15 minutes, and were enormous, and for six, seven, eight voices. All three of those composers wrote something called a Western Wind Mass, which is using a pop song of the time called, called Western Wind. Um, so we have the Long Anne, Western Wind. Thing, um, composers are challenging each other to use certain uh, uh, material for their mass settings. Taverner, however, um, matured very quickly. And by the time he was uh, finishing up at Cardinal College, uh, now the cathedral in Oxford, um, he had developed his style. He pulled in a lot of ideas from continental practice of imitation, a humanist idea about the text, getting the text clear. And that's when he wrote this mean mass for five voices. We're going to sing the Sanctus now. Before we do, I'm going to point out a very quick um, uh, another example of how mass music has had other genres spit out from it, and that's that in a mass by Tavern called Gloria Tibi Trinitas, in the Benedictus, there's a, you know the in nomine, in nomine, there's a two page um, bit of uh, music uh, saying the words in nomine, and those two pages were so beautiful that it spawned an entire genre of instrumental music throughout the 16th and 17th centuries in England, called in nomines, and um, groups of viral players would play in nomines, written by all sorts of composers, taking his music as a basis, just from a mass setting. So these masses were a big deal. And this is the mean mass by Tabla. <coughs>
So that's a very uh, early example of England trying to reclaim some of the uh, prestige it had uh, in the middle of the 50th century with a wonderful setting by Tabernacle. So after this, uh, we move to Rome. All focus in mass composition moves to Rome. Um, the council, obviously, uh, in the middle of the 16th century there, is making it um, the centre for all sorts of artistic innovations. And there's uh, three main big names that can come at you. Lassus, Palestrina, Victoria. We all know who they are. We will hear them almost every Sunday. Um, and that's an interesting history of, in, in and of itself. Why, why is it we hear those settings here in London and as if you across Europe? But that's um, another talk for our day. Um, at this point, uh, there's a big development in the paraphrase idea of taking a bit of chant and using it, specifically in the masses of Palestrina, because he's been tasked in um, sort of about, I think it was 1570, he's tasked by the Pope to clean up the gradual and take away all. Um, additions and uh, not physically clean up, but um, people have been adding bits in and making it more and more artistic and florid for hundreds of years. <coughs> and the Pope said, I want you to clean up the gradual and, and all the chant and bring it back down to something a bit more pure or basic. So he is working on chant ceaselessly, and you can tell that this is happening because it's all, all these plain chant hymns are making their way into his compositions and in his mass settings. Um, Palestrina basically invented the sound of the polyphonic mass and um, wrote so many, 104 he wrote, um, that uh, it, no, the mass would never be the same after he turned it into what we now think, think, think it is. You know, paired imitation of parts, so you have tenor and bass and then the soprano alto, and they copy each other, and the interplay, and the way the parts move around each other. The way that he separates the text up into sections, the way that some of the sections go into three time. The way that sometimes we have uh, piano long chords um, on certain important bits. Obviously we've heard the um, foundations of these rules, but Palestrina sets them, he codifies them. And uh, we're going to sing part of my favourite Palestrina mass now, which is Messa Eterna Christi Munera. Um, and this is a paraphrase from a, a bit of plain chant. And I want to just uh, tell you how it works. He doesn't just um, use the first bit of the chant in his composition. We're going to hear the Kyrie now. The first Kyrie, he uses the first line of the chant. For the Christe, he uses the second line. And for the third Kyrie, he uses the third line of the chant. So he's continually going back to it for material. You can hear it all the way through. And as in the other setting we heard, um, it's not just in one part, it's in all the parts. Every single thing about this mass setting is from the Eterna Christi Munera hymn, which goes, Eterna Christi Munera, Apostolorum Gloriam, Laudes Carmentes Debitas. And the last line, which isn't said, Letis Canamus Mentibus. So I'm going to remind you one time, though, so you can listen out for them, otherwise it's just us singing at you. So, Eterna Christi Munera. Let's have the singers up. Sing out for here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Mixing it up a bit and using it as the material for your mass. A parody is when you take a piece, a polyphonic piece, that you or someone else has already written, and you use it to um, and you use it to write your piece. So you take actual lines, whole lines, chords, progressions, quotes from a polyphonic piece. Um, and the people got into trouble for this um, because they used to use chassons and rather racy material. And that's one of the things that obviously, when the council came, um, said whatever it did say about music, which was very small, but we did say is don't use secular music as uh, your inspiration, and let's please hear the words. So here is a, a good example of both of those things by Victoria. It's his um, Gloria from Missa O Quan Gloriosum. I chose this because I hope that most people might know O Quan Gloriosum by Victoria, and you could hear. Lots of quotes in the Gloria. How are we doing for time? Um, okay, so like another, another five to ten. Very good, excellent. So as much as that's the right amount. Uh, so here's uh, Miss Oakland Gloriosa by Victoria, the Gloria from it. <coughs> Thank you. 
was bird writing at the end of the 16th century um, for private households. And you can hear a such pleading, <coughs> such pleading in that music um, for a, a persecuted community. <coughs> um, just going to end with some ideas and uh, a very quick uh, explanation. Of, obviously, the mass continues to evolve and continues to develop as a compositional form uh, into the 18th century with the big Viennese masses, and, and it turns in Italy into something of a concertato mass. We have the instruments of Venice and all of this. Lots of different ways people turn the mass into concert work. Um, and and these, these avenues persist. Uh, but there's, a, there's an interesting concept that mass is a cycle. Um, when we use music in the studio, we do so for three reasons. Adding delight to prayer, fostering oneness of spirit, and investing the rites with greater solemnity. When we sing, we're using an elevated form of speech, one which occupies our whole self, rooted in both our most ancient custom and also in evolutionary theory, singing is a form of communication worthy of the divine. The late medieval mass, in Duffy's words, uh, is founded upon a complex and dynamic understanding of the role of both distance and proximity, concealment and exposure, with people's oral experience of mass being mainly musical, a choral polyphonic ordinary was on the front line of one's experience of ritual. The actio is concealed and distant, but the oratio which it provokes inside us is incredibly personal. But why set the ordinary as a single composition? Overriding concern in most settings, as in the message of the Mass itself, seems to have been consistency and unity of utterance across all five movements or across the hour of Mass. A sound polyphonic ordinary setting embodied a series of advantages integrated with great elegance. First, it could be linked to a special occasion through a parody, a paraphrase, or a cantus <laughs> It could be linked to a special occasion. Second, in the Sanctus and the Benedictus, this message could be brought into contact with the moment of grace and delivered to the Redeemer on the altar. And thirdly, this proximity with the Redeemer was then extended across the whole rite and the whole mass through the integration of themes across a cyclic setting, an all-encompassing Plea. So I hope I've told you something you didn't know about setting the mass and how one goes about it. And uh, uh, yeah, um, next time when you're listening in church, you can think about some of those ways which the masses were put together. Thank you very much. subtlety and richness in this whole history that you've given us and I think you I think probably for me anyway you've given points that really will stick in our minds to give us ideas to think about next time we're in mass and we're listening to music so it's incredibly uh, privileging to hear all of this thanks so much Matthew and um, it's freezing in here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we just to sort of wrap it up now and say thanks very much for coming, everyone. Um, the next one I just checked on my um, uh, calendar is on the 20th of January here, and it's Christopher Francis talking about um, music in the Mass. So another piece of, um, in, let's say, another a session on music, which I think is going to wrap things up very beautifully for us. So. Merry Christmas and see you in the new year, I hope. Thanks again, Matthew.